And we're happy to have Gary Elliott tonight with us. He's going to talk about his new book, The 1849 Cholera Outbreak in Jefferson City. Gary is a music educator by training, and he also, but he works as a professional land surveyor. Um, he's also the author of two other books. So we're happy to have him, and we're ready to hear what he's got to say about this interesting historical um, era. <laughs> so welcome, Gary. Well, thank you, Madeline. Um, and there'll be if, time for questions afterwards. I'm sorry, yes. Yes. <laughs> If something's not viewing right, let me know. Okay. Um, so I'm I'm excited to be here. I'm glad that the, the library asked me to come and speak to you. Wish we could do this in person. It's a little little easier. Sometimes technology becomes a problem. So um, I hope that everything goes smoothly tonight. Um, I'm here to talk not just about my book, but I'm here to talk about a journey. And this is actually several journeys. But first off, I'd like to say that if, if you have not seen the video I did at the Missouri State Archives, that is available on YouTube. That was back at the beginning of February. And you can go to YouTube and just search the title of the book and, and you'll find it that way. Now, if you have seen it, you will find that a lot of the things I say tonight are different. I don't like to repeat the same thing twice um, because that way you encourage the same people to come back again. Now, the two journeys that I want to talk about, one, of course, is the journey of those involved in the book, those who traveled um, to Jefferson City in 1849 with the cholera, but the other journey is my own personal journey that led to the creation of this book. I never started out to write a book. I was just had a, a topic that I was curious about. A couple of years ago, I had a friend of mine who referred me to um, the city of Jefferson website. And um, Let's see if I can, there we go. Okay. Um, the city of Jefferson website where there are two sentences and it said very simply, a frightening event or a frightening incident took place in 1849 when a ship carrying Mormon church members, some of whom had cholera, landed at the city dock. For two years, the plague infected residents in the area, paralyzing the local trade. Now, when, when a person is writing a book, I would think that you have four questions that need to be addressed, and that's the who, what, when, and where. And we've probably heard that before. And those two sentences actually addressed all of those questions, but just in a very brief manner. Who, it tells us that there was a group of Mormon church members, and um, what? Some of them had cholera. When? 1849. Now, 1849, that's a broad era. You know, we've got to narrow that down. Who And where? They landed at the city dock. Well, that's a good, that's a good place. Now, does everybody know where the city dock is? And I'm sure there's some, some that don't. Now, as I put, put this book together, it was a process, not necessarily for me a very systematic one. And uh, some of you may be more systematic in how you, you do things. Um, I'm kind of all over the place with this. And um, when you think about writing a book, if any of you have ever thought about that, some of you may have thought, well, I'm not educated enough. Um, I didn't study to be a writer or I don't have any idea where to begin. And my advice to you is it doesn't matter because in the end, what you write is what's in your heart. And that's what I did. And my journey may not be the same for you, but it's something that worked for me. Now, if you're interested in a fiction book, 
it's a little bit different because there's not as much research involved. But if you're in interested in any kind of a history book or even just curious about a topic, then this is research would be the same for all of you. Now, so with the little bit of information I had, I had to figure out how do I find more about this because that didn't tell me very much. So my probably the first thing I did is I went to the internet. And most of us, when we want to search something on the internet, we, we either, we Google it. Whether we use Google or some other search provider, we still say we Google it. And so using words such as Jefferson City Cholera, 1849, I started Googling it. Now, quickly learned, and, and I've known this before, that Google doesn't always have all the answers. Now, they like to think that, that they do, and they like to tell you that, but there are multitude of other search engines out there. And I've listed here some of them, and there's more than that. Um, but these are some of the more well-known ones. And most of these I used, and I used them constantly, and such as Google, Bing, uh, DuckDuckGo, Ecosia, Quant, Yahoo, and one that, I've, that I've, I like that, that doesn't overwhelm me as much with, with results is Ixquick has been renamed to Start Page, uh, Yippee, and Dogpile. And like I said, there's many more than that. But every time I came up with something new, I turned back to the internet and started searching again. And the difference between some of the different search engines could be simply in the way that they're organized, that you may find first what you're looking for, but on another site, it may be way down there. And when you've got a hundred thousand different hits on a, on a phrase, you want to narrow it down as much as possible. So please, when you're searching anything, use as much variety as you can. Also, another place that was a great help right at the beginning was libraries. And, um, Oh, I thought I had a page out of sequence, sorry. Um, libraries are wonderful. And we have a good library here in Jefferson City, but I used other libraries also. And one thing I did with libraries is I would just go to the library and I would find the general area that I wanted. In this case, it had to do with Missouri history, was a good, or local history was a good place to start. And I would just start at one end of the aisle and I'd look at every book or the title of the books. And if something caught my eye, I would pull it down and look to see, is there anything in there? And um, so that's a good place to go. But knowing that this ship carried a group of Mormons or members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I turned to the Church History Library, and that's exactly what it's called in Salt Lake City. Now, I had used this resource before, so I was familiar with, with how to use it. And they had a large collection of digitized books, uh, papers, letters, all kinds of things. And through, through the two sources of just general searching and through this, I found the key to this story. And it really began with a man named William Appleby and there's his wife, Sarah Brown Price. And they were living in Reckless Town, Pennsylvania. And they were asked to lead a group of church members from Philadelphia to Council Bluffs, Iowa. And the biggest help I had in finding who they were, and this was through the Church History Library, is he kept a daily journal. And it wasn't just a, you know, a hit or miss, you know, every now and then some of us may do that but he kept it for years and he kept pretty detailed account of things that happened in his life and so he detailed the whole whole journey that he was involved with 
Now, I knew this was 1849. I may not have known the exact date at that point. So it was just a matter of paging through his journal until I could find those entries that talked about it. Now, if you get in on the debate of whether we should teach cursive or not, here's a page out of his journal. And I know it's a little small and maybe hard to read, but he actually had pretty good handwriting. But some of it gets a little hard to read. And those who have read cursive um, articles from the 1800s, a good example is how do you spell Missouri? It looks like M-I-F because the double S's were written like an F. So you have to be familiar with some of the anomalies that happen in the writing. And also recognize that sometimes they didn't spell things the same. But it was a, it was a big boost for me to, to be able to find that journal. And I constantly went back to it and referred to, to different things in it or looking earlier or later to find any kind of supplemental information. Now, with this journal, I had names because I had Appleby and his wife and his children. And throughout his journal, he kept names of some of the other passengers um, that were in their group. And even when they got to Jefferson City, there were people that were named. So that was a lot of information that was very valuable. And every time I found a new piece of information, it gave me something new to search for on the internet. And so I'm constantly going back and forth and saying, well, I need to look up this person, or he talked about this event or this steamship or you know, whatever. And so I was constantly going back and forth. But in addition to this, when I, went, when I got putting this book together, I thought, well, you know, these were real people. And just like us today, we like to be remembered. And so I took every name that I came across in the book and I looked for them on some of the major family history websites. And these are the main ones I looked at. And there, were, there are others out there um, like Ancestry, Family Search, Find My Past, My Heritage, Jeanneanet, Roots Web, and American Ancestors. Each one of these has its own benefits, but at the same time, you find sometimes the same records on each of them. But it's still worth looking the same records on different sites. A good example would be census records. Um, Ancestry, Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage all have images of census records. However, some of them have better quality images and some have better search engines. So that was, that was good. Things I were looking for when I went through these websites is I was trying to piece together a little bit of their life, like maybe where they came from, how old they were. Did anybody put a story and attach it to them on this site? And so that was a big plus that I was looking for. And did I find much? I found actually quite a bit um, we would have loved to have more, but sometimes you just got to take what you get. Now, another source that's maybe also kind of tedious to search through, and that's newspapers. And that's a very valuable because now I had narrowed this down and I haven't told you the date yet. It was, to, it was the first, it was the early May of 1849 when the steamship landed at, at Jefferson City. So one of the first places I went is I went down to the Missouri River Regional Library. And they have a wonderful collection of microfilmed newspapers of the Jefferson City and Cole County area. And I knew the area or the knew the time frame, and I think there was only one newspaper that was available at that time. And so I, I looked at looked at it on the microfilm. Now, if you're unfamiliar with using microfilm or using microfilm readers, the librarians are very helpful and they can help you load it and show you how to work it. And one thing that I did constantly as I found information, whether it was on the internet or um, 
on microfilm is I made sure I copied it because it, how many times have we been interested in something and we can't remember where we got it or exactly. It just sounds it. Yeah. You already recognize it? Now, what was that? Oh, so um, uh, with the with the microfilm readers at the library, you can print them. You can print the copy of what you're looking at. You can save it to a flash drive, or you can even email it to yourself. And so it's good to have that copy for, to come back to it for a reference. And the same thing with articles that I found on the, on the internet. I made sure that I had copies of those. And one of the benefits of doing that, or one of the reasons to do that, is if you plan on writing something that's going to use footnotes, endnotes, or bibliography, you need those references. And it's sometimes hard to go back and find it again. Now, with some of the newspapers, there are several, these are the major newspaper resources out there. And most, some of these you've probably heard of, newspapers.com, there's newspaperarchive.com. And actually I found that to be one of the most valuable sources because it had more than newspapers I was looking for than some of the others. There's Chronicling America, which is through the Library of Congress. There's Genealogy Bank. There's a site called Elephant, elephant.com. And you may not have heard of that, but it's a collection of newspapers from around the world. A lot of them come from different college libraries or different parts of the country. And so you can find sources there that you may not elsewhere. It also has access and, and um, indexes chronicling America. And then there is the State Historical Society of Missouri. And on their webpage, they have some early papers from Missouri that have been, been digitized and searchable. Um, most of those are later in the 1800s, but those are good. And they also have some that they have a search engine too, but, but no image of it. And they just tell you where it is. Now, why would I need something later than 1849? Well, a lot of times newspapers will publish a section that says a um, hundred years ago today, this happened or 50 years ago today, this happened. And so you could find where it was referred to in later years in, in newer newspapers or sometimes um, like the people that were involved in this before they died, maybe they were interviewed by a newspaper. And so it wasn't just limited to one specific date in searching. Now I do have to say we have the newspaper resources and we have the family history resources. And unfortunately, most of those are by subscription. The good thing is, is most of them also have usually a free seven day, sometimes a 14 day um, free subscription. So you can look at them for a short term. Also, some of them are available through the public libraries. I know here in, in Jefferson City, we have access to Ancestry. A lot of your, some of your other libraries have access to more of these um, that you may have to go there in person and, and access them. Um, so there's, there's ways to get around some of that. So um, let me um, back out of this, this for a minute. So I don't want you to just stare at the screens and, and wonder, okay, what else is he gonna show us now? Um, and I mentioned, I mentioned earlier about using public and libraries, but also university libraries. And I found that um, they were a wonderful source. And also in the university libraries, Now, somebody said my video wasn't on. Is it on now? No. No.
I'm not sure why, but you saw the screens, the, the, the PowerPoint, so? Yes, yes. Okay, well, that's more important. That's better to look at than me. Uh, maybe we'll figure this, figure this out, but I'm not sure why. Um, so I, I spend a lot of time at some of the university libraries in St. Louis because they are huge. And some of them have quite a collection of, of books such as relating to, um, there it is. Yes, there you are. Ship, shipbuilding, yeah, I'm, Zoom I'm not real, real familiar with. So I'm, I'm sorry about that and, and that I created that you didn't get to see me. But um, um, St. Louis University or, or Missouri, University of Missouri at St. Louis, get to get the words right, has quite a collection of books on ships and, and steamships. And so looking for books there, I was able to find, it was amazing how many books talked about this incident in 1849. It was it was all over the place, so we look we look wherever we can, and backing up to the. Oh no, it's here. Another thing is is if you find a book, or reference to something, but you don't it doesn't have the full description, or maybe that's you want more information than is in that little clip that they have in, on the on the internet. Maybe it's just a quote from it. A good place, good way to find the book is to go to WorldCat. And WorldCat will, when you type in the book, it'll show you all the copyright information. And it also will tell you what libraries have it. And so you can look at different libraries. Well, hey, I can go to Columbia or I can go to Mizzou or maybe Lincoln University has it. And, um, and that's how I got into the university libraries. But also, I had found another resource that I had not expected, and that has to do with um, master's or doctoral theses. And I found one that had written about some of the steamship disasters or steamship travel on the Missouri. It was a master's thesis, and I found two different libraries in St. Louis that had copies of it. So that was very valuable and helpful. So no matter how you look at it, you can you can find information everywhere and you just have to be creative in, in where you look. Now, as I researched, I started writing. I need to organize my thoughts. I wanted to tell the story. I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I thought, well, maybe I'll put a little, maybe just a newspaper article or maybe just a short article together. And I didn't know. So Word was a good place for me to write this. And, um, but not everybody has Word anymore. So, so a generic program or another program like Google Docs is good, um, OpenOffice or Libra. The only concern is you just be aware that sometimes when you transfer a document from one format to another, there could be just small differences. And so, um, I discovered that if I was doing a writing in a generic program, that the final formatting looked different than it did in Word. I was lucky that at my work, I have the most recent version of Word and it was very helpful, but, uh, but these other um, generic ones work just as well. So um, that's kind of my research not known or part of my journey, really. No particular order how I did this because I was kept constantly going back and forth through different sources. Every time I'd find something, I'd search again. And by, by typing it out, I was able to go in and just fill in the blanks and move things around. Now, um, so let's go back to a little bit more of the storyline. And so what we have is there we go. Whoops. Get it right. So the story began with William Appleby and his family and about 80 members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And they left Philadelphia on April 12, 1849 
and they had, I think it was 17,000 pounds of call it luggage, <laughs> all their belongings. They may have had wagons, animals, personal belongings. It was a lot. And traveling from Philadelphia, they had to travel first by, by train. And you can see the train right here at the beginning. Then it was canal boat and then train again, which actually I think took them through the mountain at that point and then canal boat the rest of the way to get to Pittsburgh. So that's kind of a neat neat way to travel and it took them it probably took them a couple of weeks i don't i don't have the, the exact dates on me right now but when they got to pittsburgh that's when kind of the excitement began because that's the first time they were able to get on an actual steamship and the steamship they were able to get on or gain passage on was the steamship nominee and this is a picture this is the only known picture of the steamship nominee and so it is typical of the steamships of that time period. And um, this was on the Ohio River. And um, this photo I found very simply by just Googling the name of the ship. Now that gets interesting when you're looking for ships because I want to know more about the steamship that this group traveled on. And so in order to find information about the steamship, the dilemma becomes is, is it a steamship? Is it a steamboat? Is it a ship? Is it a packet? And if you're not familiar with the term packet, packet is a steamship that carried cargo in addition to passengers. Is it a steamer? And then the steamship that ended up here at Jefferson City was the James Monroe. Is it the James Monroe or is it the Monroe? And you, most of the time you saw it just simply as the Monroe. So if I was searching on the internet for information on that, I would have to take each one of those terms in various formats and search them all because sometimes I would find things that way. So, Leaving April 12th from Philadelphia, this group from, from Philadelphia ended up in St. Louis on May 2nd. And um, where did they travel on that ship? Well, a ship has several different places where passengers can stay. stay. This is a, a typical layout of a, of a sideboard steamship and um, you had the various staterooms which were comfortable and gave you access to all the dining hall and and different amenities of the steamships they were furnished better than some of the hotels but the the staterooms or the cabins cost a cost quite a bit more so most of these from Philadelphia decided to stay on the deck and the deck passage is a lot cheaper. There was the main deck, there was the boiler deck and there was also the hurricane deck. And so they stayed on, on one of those three or on, on all three. Now the problem with staying on the deck is the way that worked is the ship would load all its cargo and then the passengers could find space among the cargo. And you can see on this that it was pretty much open air, unless you could get inside a little more, but it wasn't a very healthy necessarily or sanitary place to stay. And um, the only amenity you got was all the free water you wanted from the river to drink. You did not eat in the dining hall. You had to bring your own food, but it was considerably cheaper. And so if money was an issue, you stayed on the deck. Now the question becomes is how many passengers does a steamship hold? And then I've never found a definitive answer, just some general ideas of how much it would hold. I'm sure it was proportional to the size of the ship and how many cabins it had. But you know, when it came to on the deck, you don't know how many people were there. 
I have seen or have read that there could have been anywhere from probably two to 400. 400 is a big extreme. Um, more likely two to 300 passengers and crew. And the crew would have numbered between 50 and 60, depending on the size of the steamship. So that's a pretty good sized ship. So we have 80 pa passengers from Philadelphia and actually they gained one in, in, in Pittsburgh. So you have an 80, 81 and um, they traveled to St. Louis. Now, when we get to St. Louis, things changed a little bit. So I talked about um, how many passengers there were. And um, we're not completely sure of how many total were there. But in St. Louis, they took time to, they were there several days and they had to find passage on another steamship because the nominee only traveled on the Ohio and on the Mississippi. It did not travel on the Missouri. So at, Ohio, at St. Louis, William Appleby was able to gain passage on the steamship James Monroe. That was not the only ship he looked at, but as the one he chose for his group to follow. Now, but we know there had to have been other people on that steamship because of its size. So who were they and where did they come from? And we find this through various newspaper reports. It tells of a group of men and a few of their, few of their sons traveling from Jeffersonville, Indiana to the gold fields of California. They were known as either 49ers or gold diggers. If you're not familiar where Jeffersonville is, it's directly north of the river from Louisville, Kentucky. And so that was a group of around 35 total. Now, some of the reports put the number down in the low 20s, but when you, when you put the whole story together and start coming up with names, there had to have been closer to 35. Now they left Jeffersonville on May 2nd, which is the day that the group from Philadelphia got to St. Louis. And they arrived in St. Louis on May 5th. So that wasn't too long of a trip to the, for them. Now the thing that made their journey exciting was with the group from Philadelphia, I had a journal that detailed and told stories of their trip. Well, what about the group from Jeffersonville, Indiana? There was one young lad of age 21 by the name of Rice McGrew who kept a diary. And the way I found that diary was through Roots Web. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever used Roots Web. It used to be popular maybe about five years ago before it was hacked and Ancestry has taken it over, but it's a free site. And I used to use it a lot. It's not as search friendly as some of the others. But I had looked up Rice McGrew's name in their search engine and didn't find anything. Well, just like all the other search engines and all the people in the book, I searched him more than once. And when I came back the next time, I found him and I found a transcription of one week of his journal of his diary, they called it, he called it a diary. I'm thinking that that may have been the only diary he kept, that he may not have kept one before, but he started it for the trip, so he had memories to share with his family. And it was really nice to have because it told a little bit of their journey, it told us some names I didn't have. And unfortunately, his diary ends on May 9th, the day before the Monroe landed at Jefferson City and Rice McGrew died on May 13th. And he died at the Presbyterian Church in Jefferson City. And there'll be more about the Presbyterian Church a little bit later. So we have right there, the group has grown. Still not, not real large. But the group from Philadelphia, they lost about a dozen of their passengers, decided to stay in St. Louis. Some of them had family there or friends. Some may have just didn't want to go any further. But they gained an additional group of passengers. 
from St. Louis led by a man named Augustus Farnham. And he, along with about 24 others, joined with the Philadelphia group. Now I might mention this picture of Augustus Farnham and the one of William Appleby. Um, pictures of them I found on Find a Grave. So there's a reason to go to Find a Grave to look for pictures, plus to see if they have an obituary that might tell you some of their life story, especially if they died. You know, did somebody put in an obituary or add a memory? So that's something to also, also take into consideration. Now, additionally, there were other passengers that were not of either group. And I know that because I found newspaper articles of two of them um, that died with name, or one that died and one that survived with their names. And, uh, and several others were just mentioned by number. But I think there was still a lot more. There was no ship manifest. So to know exactly how many is really difficult. And um, you reach a point where you're done searching and it's like, I found what I can, but there still may be more out there. So the James Monroe left St. Louis on the morning of May 8th and it arrived in Jefferson City on May 10th. So that wasn't, that was basically a two day trip we take it for granted that it's only a two hour drive for us to go to St. Louis. They took two days. And um, it might've taken longer because some of the passengers and crew got sick with cholera and died. And so they just did what was standard then. They just pulled over to the side. Um, they had a box made by the ship's carpenter. They dug a shallow grave, stuck the box in and left. It was just, it was just very simple and they did it as quickly as they could. So when they get to Jefferson City, and I like this picture of Jefferson City, this is an 1861 um, sketch that was actually in Harper's Weekly. And we can see, if you can see my cursor, we have the Capitol over here on the right. And you're looking at that and saying, well, boy, that looks different. Well, it was a different capital. Remember the one we have today with burn back in the, the early 1900s, or the, was built back in the early 1900s. This one burnt in the early 1900s. And then over here in the here. middle, we have um, Loman's Landing or the Loman Building. And right out in front of it, and this is the only picture I've seen, we have the city wharf. And you can kind of make out its shape. And we got some black struck things on it, which could be people or um, maybe some supplies that were, were dropped off there. The city wharf was approved by the Board of Aldermen in 1847. And the location of it was found very simply by, I Googled Board of Aldermen, Jefferson City, and I found that the city of Jefferson's webpage has the Board of Aldermen's minutes from ever since they began. Even up until today, they have the city, city council minutes. You want this for my so another picture that I kind of like, whoops, go the right direction. Jefferson City is this one, which was actually from a postcard and if we look at this, there's something different than the one previous. And let me go back just one. Here we see a train. And so the question becomes is when did the train come through Jefferson City? And the actual first train to come through Jefferson City was around March of 1856. The tracks were completed in 1855. So if you're trying to date a photograph, that's, that's one way to help date it. But we look at this one, where's the train? There's no train there. There's also no wharf. And, uh, and the date on this postcard said the Capitol in 1842. And you can see the Capitol, yes, it looks different. It's also rotated 90 degrees from what we're familiar with today. So, um, 
once the steamship got to Jefferson City, then we got into a lot of discrepancies. And different sources provided three different descriptions of the passengers on the Monroe. One source would say it was a shipload of Mormons, just like the city of Jefferson's webpage says. Another one would say it was a shipload of California gold diggers with no mention of anyone else. And then some of them would say it included both groups. And I like the one that said it was mainly California gold diggers, even though they were outnumbered three to one by the group of church members from Philadelphia. So a lot of discrepancies there. And so sometimes you have to just like, okay, what is correct? How do I make sense of this? The personal witnesses in Appleby Journal and um, McGrew's diary were, were wonderful because it helped narrow things down. But when it came to the newspapers, you have to take it sometimes, it's like today, you know, do you believe everything you read? You'd like to, but you know, sometimes they stretch it or, or didn't have full information when they wrote it. And so there are things like that. But to give you an idea of um, just a, a short little exercise on deception, and I don't know where, how this happened. I thought this was a really neat picture of the State House, Jefferson City, Missouri. And that's what it says across the bottom, State House, Jefferson City, Missouri. And I look at that, well, there's the Capitol, there's Loman's Landing. But something's not right. And um, this is exactly how I found the picture on the internet. And if you're, if you're sitting there scratching your head, what is not right? Well, let me show you the correct image. All the same things, but there's a difference. I had to flip it because, and it across the bottom, it's hard to read. It still says State House, Jefferson City, Missouri, but it's, it's a mirror image. So someone had posted this on the internet in the mirror image, but we know when we stand at the Loman building, we should be able to see the Capitol behind it and we see the river on the right. So that's kind of a little bit of deception there. Now, how could we date this photograph? Well, one thing we know is there is no railroad. So it has to be before 1855. But the other thing is, is it does not appear to be any wharf. And so it has to be before 1847. The wharf, you could say, well, maybe it's off the picture, but it wasn't that far over from the Loman building. And in front of the Loman building is what was known as Water Street at the time. And the, the street on the close side of the Loman building is Jefferson Street. So that gives you, if you're familiar with Jefferson City, that gives you a little better perspective of how that, how that sits. Now, after the Monroe landed, at the city wharf, many of the passengers and crew left the ship to find lodging in the city. Some of them found lodging in the Missouri house. Now, James A. Crump, the original owner of the Loman building, opened the Missouri house in April of 1841. And the Missouri house was located on the upper floors of the Loman building. So that's where the Missouri, the Missouri house comes into this. And some tried to find lodging there. It was a little bit difficult to, to, for many of them, they, they wouldn't let them in. Others went a little bit further up Jefferson Street to the Northwest corner of High and Jefferson to the Virginia Hotel. Now in 1874, the Virginia Hotel was sold and became the Central Hotel. And it remained the Central Hotel for many years. And um, of course, it's no longer there. It's part of the Capitol grounds. But then others, they found lodging in some of the vacant homes in the city. And there are a lot of vacant homes in the city when their owners journeyed to California to search for gold. So the steamship arrived around 10 o'clock in the morning, and that's what Appleby records in his journal. And then it was moved to the penitentiary by nightfall. 
Now this is one of the earliest pictures or maybe the earliest I could find of the penitentiary. And this is from 1869. And um, so this, where exactly did the steamship end up? And he, nobody says, it just says near the penitentiary. But the penitentiary had its own wharf. And it needed that because for those that have been around long enough, you, remember, you may remember some of the shoe factories up around the penitentiary. And so there were a lot of manufacturing and other things that went on there. And so they needed a place to, to unload their, their supplies. And the wharf for the prison was located at the end of Chestnut Street. Now, Chestnut Street is a street that runs just on the east side of the penitentiary. But I'm not sure if, if Chestnut ever extended all the way through to the river because we see right down here in the front, we see people walking up this, this roadway along the south side over to the west side of the penitentiary to Lafayette Street. And that makes perfect sense that the, the ship would have docked somewhere near there and the passengers could get off and come up the street there. Now, just a little bit of information on the penitentiary. The penitentiary received its first male inmate in 1836 and its first female inmate in 1842. Now, everyone agrees that the Monroe was moved to near the prison, but things get a little bit vague here in both location. Appleby writes about visiting members of the of his company on the Monroe while it was located near the prison. And he talks about it in the rain, you know, and it was rainy weather at that time. And that's typical early May. The 1889 history of Cole County, Missouri says that in 1849, the Monroe, the cholera stricken Mormon vessel landed all of her passengers below the city where 63 died and were buried. Now that's in a little bit of disagreement because there's no question that they landed first at the city wharf before it was moved to near the prison. But it says that all were, were landed below the city, which would not be the wharf. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy there. The other thing that, that the history of Cole County says is that in April 1849, this is a month before the Monroe got there, two Negroes brought here by Dr. Brown and one citizen died of this disease, which was cholera. So some have said that, well, cholera came here because of the steamship. Cholera was already here. And, and I confirmed what the the county history said in newspaper reports of the of the time back in April, and I think even in March, talking about Dr. Brown having visited in the eastern part of the state, I think by Cape Girardeau, and coming back here and, and dying with cholera. So cholera was, uh, was already here. It wasn't real prevalent, and the city tried very hard to keep it that way. The city was very proud of its city and tried to keep it very clean, and so the frustrating thing is, is you don't find a lot of reports of the cholera at that time. One local newspaper gave us the name of two individuals or two citizens of Jefferson City that died of cholera as a direct result of the Monroe. Another newspaper tells us that there were 25. But when you look at the 1850 census mortality schedule, which runs from June 1st of 1849 to May 31st of 1850, they only listed 24 as having died of the cholera. That wasn't very many. Now, not all, everybody that died was probably listed because um, just like the census today, people get missed. But it also said that they all died, died suddenly. So if they had gotten it from mem members of the Monroe, they wouldn't have died later in the year. Another example of that is 
James McHenry, who was a young lad of, I think, 14 at the time, and he recalled back around 1900, early 1900, that there was a Tom, Presley Thomas Corda, Cordell, that he died of cholera in July, and he was, he's relating that to the Monroe. Well, it's, it's a little late for that. Interestingly, the mortality schedule lists his cause of death as bilious dysentery. So there's an example too of some, a discrepancy, or I like to call it a faded memory. So the next question becomes is where are the dead buried? And, uh, but before I get to that, let's talk a little bit more about what happened in Jefferson City. And I think I meant to, that's okay. Um, multiple people were sick and dying crew and passengers, they needed to be cared for somewhere. At first, the locals may have been a little hesitant to do anything because of fear of the unknown. Cholera was not considered contagious as we understand contagious today. At the urging of Dr. William Armstrong Davison, he was a local parishioner and vestryman from the Episcopal Church, and at his urging, the Episcopal Church opened its doors to be used as a hospital. Now, the Episcopal Church was located on the east side of Madison Street, just south of the corner of Madison and Main Street. I believe that's a parking garage today. But additionally, the Presbyterian Church which was located on the south side of Maine, just east of Jefferson Street, and across from the then governor's mansion was used as a hospital. The governor's mansion is actually, a part of it is in a parking lot today. There were also other buildings used as hospitals. The White House, or Rias White House, a vacant hotel located at the southwest corner of Maine and Jefferson Street, was used as a hospital for this group. But other reports tell of the Methodist Church located on the south side of Main Street between Madison and Monroe and the Gustavus Parsons home being used as hospitals. But I've not been able to confirm that they were used for the, the victims of the Monroe. They may have been used in later years or even later when the, the cholera with the Silver War came about. So let's talk a little bit about this disease known as cholera. Cholera first appeared in 1848 in St. Louis. It traveled from India to Europe and then to New Orleans where it came up the Mississippi to St. Louis. From there it traveled east on the Ohio River and west on the Mississippi, on the Missouri River. There is a plethora of historic information available regarding cholera. In addition to searching newspapers and various books, I found a lot of information from a website known as the Wellness Library. And it had a lot of things, a lot of books there from the 1800s on cholera. Some of the speculated causes of cholera included lack of ozone in the atmosphere or miasmic vapors, a high number of thunderstorms, eating excitable foods such as sauerkraut, or, eating of, or the eating of ripe vegetables. Some of the cures were whitewashing of houses, sulfur tablets were preventative, tobacco smoke enemas, electric shock, immersion in a tub of ice water or alternating between hot and cold baths, even a weekly bath. And keeping out of the night air while retiring to bed early was recommended. Your kids would be happy with only a weekly bath. Drugs containing such ingredients as calomel, laudanum, opium, camphor, cassic, capsicum, and spirits of ammonia were routinely, routinely used. Additionally, some physicians believed in bloodletting, vein injections, cottering, and cutting the carotid artery in the throat. Even the use of chamomile tea, tobacco, and port wine were recommended. Unfortunately, many times, the death rate was higher when patients were treated with these remedies. Doctors lost a lot of their credibility. 
In August 1849, the New York Herald stated that doctors were worse than cholera because the pestilence might come now and then, physicians we had always with us. Cholera was known to have killed half to two thirds of those infected. The symptoms of cholera, which are very similar to acute arsenic poison began with diarrhea, acute spasmodic vomiting and painful cramps. The disease loosened the bowels and let gushes of what was called rice water stool. The floating white specks were bits of lining from the small intestines. The explosion diarrhea was followed by a hurling up of the contents of the stomach. Patients' eyes sank into their heads. The skin turned leathery, their lips bluish. And this is a great picture showing a difference between pre-cholera and during cholera. Even if they did survive, many were left with the possibility of long-term side effects, especially issues of the kidneys. In 1849, the Committee of Hygiene in Paris, France released a report of their opinions on the treatment of cholera. Their opinions were that cholera is not contagious and it is important that this fact should be thoroughly understood. They determined that cholera is not contagious from person to person, but is spread only through unsanitary water or food supply sources. Physicians also said the disease spreads among the deck passengers. Very few cases were, are ever reported by the cabin passengers. That was just the opposite of on the Monroe. Most of those that died or got cholera were those who were staying in cabins and not on the deck. So back a little bit to our timeline. The steamship Monroe landed at the city wharf down near the state capitol on May 10th, 1849, around 10 a.m. Some passengers left the sick, left the ship, carrying with them their dead, looking for places to stay. Some of the locals helped to attend to them. By nightfall, it was ordered to drop down the river just below the prison. Some later writers told of a death trench being dug near Loman's Landing. Personally, I find no logic in that idea and I haven't found any evidence supporting that. William Appleby tells of visiting the Monroe from time to time to seek after his goods. And he wrote of the sick and dying graves by their side that fits in with what the history of Cole County said about the, the ship was unloaded at the prison and um, that's where they died. This is, these are not the only accounts that imply that there were those that had died near the, the penitentiary. I think the most likely scenario is that they're actually buried in multiple locations. I have not found any. Um, absolute proof of where they are, but it's something, there may be a record out there somewhere. Now, another side light to this is, some of you may recognize this picture. This is a picture of Mosby Monroe Parsons, the son of Gustavus Parsons. He was also involved in the, with the Confederacy during the Civil War, but at this time he served as public administrator for the county. And so when the ship landed, he, through his office, confiscated much of the goods of those that had died. And one way, one place I found information, and it wasn't easy to find, but the girls at the, at the county courthouse were so helpful. And this is the probate case for a W.D. Adams, and there was a W.D. Adams on the ship, and in it, and you can't read this, I know, and, and it, this is, is the best copy they could get. It was very old and faded, and I darkened it a little bit, but right in here, he, he names all the different people that were part of this, this court case, and there's about, I think there's eight of them that are named in there, and it was easy for me to read because I knew the names and that makes a big difference. And I see right here, just offhand Rice McGrew. And um, 
but he confiscated their goods until they could be claimed. The thing that fascinated me about Rice McGrew is his diary made it back to Indiana, along with his Scottish Dirk. And both of those are still in possession of the family today. So the story does not end with the death of cholera. Up to half of the passengers and crew are reported to having died. But what about the survivors? Using many of the family history or genealogy websites I previously listed, I tried to find out what happened to each individual. Not all of them could be identified. Of those that lived, some returned to their departure point. Two or three of those from Indiana continued on to California with the rest going home. And 40 to 50 of those from Philadelphia and St. Louis were able to continue on their journey to Council Bluffs, Iowa and points beyond. How you write a book, how you do your journey and how you format it is up to you. Just remember that a publisher will probably change the style that you, you decided on or the format you decided on. This book was written using the Chicago Manual of Style. A different topic might require a different style, such as MLA or APA. Good to check that out before you get too far into your writing. I wrote as I researched. It was so easy to cut and paste. Do you want footnotes or endnotes? That may be dependent upon the publisher. I wrote footnotes, but the publisher wanted endnotes. In Word, it was a simple push of a button and it moved them. I was excited when I had 25 pages. At 75 pages, I contacted my first publisher. He said it was too short. He said I should shorten it and make it a journal article. At 180 pages with images, I easily found a publisher. And I'm grateful to the History Press through Arcadia Publishing um, for their willingness and interest in publishing the book. I found that the format that they used was very similar to the one that I had envisioned. And I thought they did a very nice job. Um, pictures and illustrations are great but be sure that you have permission to use them. If they're not public domain, you need to contact the person who holds the, the image to get permission. And that can be tedious. Sometimes that can take a while. Um, proofread everything and ask others to read parts of it, of it as you write. Um, if, you're, if your spouse, if you're married or, or have close family fr or friends, ask them to read it. Well, you say, well, they're not good readers or they don't, they don't like to read. It doesn't matter. They'll tell you whether they like it or not. Spell check, but spell check isn't always right. Sometimes you want to use the spelling that you have. Grammar is another, pro, another obstacle. Grammarly is a good program. There's a free version of that on the, on the internet and I use that many, many times didn't always agree with everything and some things I did not change, but it's good to use. There's also a paid for version that will find more things. So the big question too then is, when do you stop writing or when do you stop researching? And it's really a personal choice. When you've reached a point where you're satisfied with what you've got and you're really not finding anything else, it's a good place to, to, to stop. Research can never finish. As I prepare my different um, programs, my speaking engagements, I find new things that I can add. Um, I like to think that the book is good. Um, I, enjoy, I enjoyed reading it. I enjoyed writing it and it was fun. And it, it can be, writing can be therapy. Um, if you don't have a copy of the book or would like to purchase a copy, it is available at the public library but it's also available at the Downtown Book and Toy and the Downtown Books 2 at Capitol Mall. Um, it's on Amazon, Arcadia Publishing webpage. Most of your major publishers have it available. Um, also, if you go to the Facebook page, 1849 Cholera Outbreak in Jefferson City, you can contact me directly and I have signed copies. Um, also on the Facebook page is where I list future speaking engagements 
Um, the next speaking engagement, public speaking engagement I have is May 5th, and that's through Loman's Landing, and that'll be on Facebook. And then, then there's some after that also. But um, I'm glad that you could be here and you could listen. And I hope that I've given you a clue about some of the things that happened and uh, given you a little clue on things that you could do if you want to write a little bit. And if it doesn't go anywhere, you've had the satisfaction of knowing that you have done it. Um, thank you. Um, questions, Madeline. Okay. Well, I have one. I wonder, did, uh, did the publisher make any changes that, uh, or suggest any changes that you didn't want to make or did they do any uh, editing, any further editing? Now, but before I sent it to the publisher, I had a friend who, who does work as an editor had gone through it and given me some, some hints. Mm -hmm. and, and I made most of those corrections. So when I sent it to the publisher, it was sent with the idea that there would be minimal editing that they'd have to do. And there were some little things, you know, maybe a couple wording things and um, a little bit of the formatting. And I think there might've been a, a maybe a little bit in the bibliography that they changed, but they had very little that they that they changed. And I think if a person does their research and um, spends a lot of time, footnotes are a mess because you've got a specific format to put them in and they're very hectic to do. And um, so, no, they didn't have to do very much. Okay. Well, any other questions? Or, you know, in chat? Yeah. Well, thank you, Gary. I appreciate that. You know, it was really interesting, right? That, what is it, research is never finished? It's just abandoned, that someone told me once. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And when you research, you find so much more than you can put in the book. Yes. And, and, and that's one thing, too, is it, after the fact, don't beat yourself up because you found something that, oh, that would have been wonderful to put in there. And sometimes it's just amazing where you find things. Um, as an example, you know, when I talked about that New York Times article talking about um, how physicians were hated at that day because they were worse than the cholera. Mm -hmm. And the way I found that is I was looking at a digitized record of some family history information in Cincinnati for my wife. And it was a record that had, oh, maybe a dozen or more different um, records in it. And included in that was a, I think it was like a 16 page article talking about cholera in 1849 in Cincinnati. It's like, wow, that doesn't help me with the journey, but it helps me with how people perceived cholera. So you never know where you're going to find something. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you very much again, and good evening. <laughs> okay. well, thank, thank you, and I'm glad, ev thankful for everyone that could come and watch. Okay. Thanks, Gary. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.